Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Um, Kenning, I, I misunderstood. I thought you were unable to join us. I'm pleased you were. You no, know, it's the August, it's the August uh, meeting that I won't be able to attend. Oh, okay, great. I had to go down and ask one of the janitors his name today because I know. Just so you know, Aaron's back on the line. Oh, Aaron. Good. Hi, Aaron. Thanks. Hey, Aaron. Welcome aboard. Asking, of course, he tells me. How is how is weather on the on the High Line? Uh, we're in Hardin right now, and it's beautiful. We're on our way back. Oh, okay. Nebraska was wonderful. Oh, wow. Well, it's two o'clock. Um, call the meeting to order. Evan's on his way. Did Aaron call in? Yeah, he Aaron's here. here. Okay. I'm. Can you hear me? Yes. I'll call the meeting okay. order, and uh, why don't we just do a, a kind of a roll call and introductions, and go from there. We'll start here in this room. I'm Bruce Newell. I'm here. Tracy Cook, Montana State Library. I'm Arla Stark, Montana State Library. Uh, Chris Schmidt, State Library. Evan Hammer, State Library. <laughs> and who else do we have? Ken Walden. <laughs> From Washington, D.C., we have Jenny and Ann. <laughs> Welcome. And this is Aaron. Aaron, you're here. And Kenning, you're here. Yes, I'm here. I'm in Bozeman. Super. And Elsie, you're here. I am. Thank you. And our friend Mr. Wall gets the prize for being um, uh, up the earliest. <laughs> Again. 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 You're, yeah. And Ken, Ken is in Perth. I Melbourne. Say again. I'm in Melbourne. Southern Australia. Southern Victoria. Australia. Well, let's um uh, let's begin with the first the first item on our agenda, the Montana Land Grant Act Grant Awards. And if I may, uh, Kevin, I'll turn this to you. I am online. Oh, I can go ahead if you want me to. Please, yeah. please go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Um, <clears throat> so what you have in front of you is this year's um, prioritized list and recommendations for funding. So you'll have a memo, and um, basically the memo just outlines what the subcommittee had accomplished. They reviewed all the 24 applications that were submitted for or um, considered for funding. And um, the Montana Land Information Advisory Council uh, voted on a amount of $250,000, so that's the approved amount this year for grants. Unfortunately, we don't have enough to fund all the grants that were recommended for funding. And so that's what um, this, this outline kind of gets into. So we, um, the council voted to approve uh, all grants one through 12 for a total of $232,963. So if you um, look at the next page, you can see the, um, the ranked grants and which, um, which entity uh, was approved for which dollar amount. And the one through 12 actually total, will make that total and the remaining balance is 17,000. And so the next two grants that are available are, um, <clears throat> Are a total a lot more than the seventeen thousand, and so what the what the council wanted me to do and recommended us to do was to see if the city of Harlem would um, would like the remaining balance of seventeen thousand dollars to do a portion of their grant. If they do, then I would work with them to develop a statement of work and stay within the bounds of the original submitted grant. If they do not, we would offer that um money to the better root conservation district and we would be able to fund their full grant and then the remaining balance would just be left in the mla account so i, I if you have any questions please just go ahead and feel free to ask but um that is what we're asking for this approval of these uh, prioritized grants
Well, this is Aaron. Oh, um, Go ahead, I just Aaron. had a, a question, um, and of course it could be. I was just noticing that out of the 10 not funded, seven of the 10 are tribes. And I, I know that you guys ranked them. Um, I was just wondering if there's something they're not doing correctly to rank into getting into the funding prioritization or, um, you know, is there some type of potential possible like future training for tribal entities to try to be a little more competitive? Because that's what it looks like is maybe they weren't competitive in this granting process. Sure, and just and just to kind of remind everyone, um, if they weren't if they weren't prioritized, it doesn't mean that they didn't have a a, a, a neat idea or a good idea for a project or um, or something that we would even find valuable. It just didn't fit in line with the land plan. In addition to maybe it just being a poorly written grant, and so um, some of these were just outside of the bounds of the land information plan, and they were going after things. Um, that we um, have not prioritized in the current in the in this coming land plan, and the other thing is um, uh, honestly one of the I think there was a contractor that did both of these grants, and um, there were some um, similar mistakes made throughout all the grants. So if you if you have a contractor writing the grants for you know it doesn't matter what entity they're writing them for, but if they end up it, um, making a mistake, what chances are you're going to have a mistake in every single grant. And so we kind of saw similar mistakes there. And um, we do offer a training, and it's in Helena, and I know that's, you know, not easy for a lot of folks in Montana to get to that, you know, are, are at least an hour or two away, but we do host it online. But we did promise at the council meeting to work with our council representative to try to um, um, get some of these grants um or some of the folks that submitted grants uh, to work with them one on one in the future and to help um, to help get these grants funded. The other thing is that, um, and we've been trying, and I think it's what the positive thing is we haven't had an, um, a grant filled out by a tribe in, in a very long time. I don't know the number of years, so I, I've been reaching out to the communities, and um, I think that this is a success in that we actually had. A bunch submitted, um, but I think that the more that they work with us, um, the better it's going to be for them in the long run, and they pitch their ideas to us. And that's one of the things we recommend in, in the process itself is if you have something that you think um, is a good idea, you, should, you know, reach out to the state library, and we will help, you know, kind of flush that out and, and help even uh, give them tips or tricks or, or give them the training um, that's we've got two years worth of training online right now, and and there's been a positive correlation for folks that take the training. They chances are they're going to have a successfully um, funded grant. So I, I know it doesn't look really great having so many tribes not funded, but I think again a lot of them they just were not in line with this year's land plan. Oh, well, that's great to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Add one thing. Uh, along those lines as well, I just wanted to add that, um, I, as the commission knows, uh, we presented uh, at the last meeting about the um, real-time network planning that we're doing. Uh, three of these are for core stations, and potentially, it, it, either if that project had come in together sooner, or if we had been able to, to move things along better, or again, potentially next year, once we have a better grasp of where we're going with real-time networks and, and possibly have that in the next land plan, those three would have likely uh, scored out a lot better. So uh, there, you know, and some, sometimes it's great to be on the cutting edge and sometimes you know, it's not always <laughs> the best place to be. So when, just when, unfortunate. When will the land plan be updated? That process? The land plan will be, uh, yeah, that's, that process starts this summer. And so the the land plan that this these grants are based on starts July one of this year and then goes the the full year. So we will finalize our the next land plan, the FY20, sometime in I think it's the November meeting, and then you 
the co- the commission will uh, adopt that or, or put your stamp of approval on it sometime at November or December meeting. Thank you. Um, this is Ken. I, I make a couple comments. I, um, I really applaud Aaron's effort to make outreach to the tribes. And I think that's really the ultimate solution to this. Um, we might also want to consider a some form of a, a tribal GIS summit or encourage that to happen, maybe not through the library, but in some fashion. Um, I think that we we did that during during the broadband era when we were mapping broadband and it was quite successful. And we learned some things in that summit that were kind of surprising and did not would not have come out in other ways. And I think um, I, I didn't, I read all the proposals in quite a bit of detail and I, I didn't see a huge difference between these and others, except that they, they tended to not fill out those opening um, objectives as thoroughly as perhaps some of the others. But I think there's a broader trend here, which I'd like to address in some way. Um, and that is, you know, we've been doing this for about 10 years. I see a growing trend with all the tribal ones. And in fact, most of the capacity building that these are, they're mostly going to um, consulting companies with that and somewhat minimal training, it seems. But um, I wonder if we can figure out a way to measure, to measure success with building GIS capacity in rural areas. Um, you know, for example, there's a heavy stress as examples on the core station on measuring things with, um, you know, sub-meter or centimeter accuracy. But when I read most of the grants for infrastructure, it's for water infrastructure that, the exception of manholes and and um, and water hydrants, most of it's underground. Um, it doesn't really, you know, address that, or I haven't seen grants address that. And so I'd really like to figure out a way without burdening staff. I think Erin's suggestion, and I think she's been pursuing this of developing best practices is a one excellent way to do it. Um, and then trying to fold those into the land plan so that there is some way to measure success. Um, I know we do that through the individuals, you know, listing their objectives and then how they're meeting those. But I don't, I haven't seen as much, you know, broad um, policy level um, ways to measure success in terms of are we really building capacity and meeting those needs. And one idea I had, I think, you know, the, everybody submits quarterly reports, or they, or at least those that are negotiated on a, I guess, case by case basis. But and, and everybody submits their data to the state library. I think perhaps more transparency. If those were published online, um, at least there'd be some way to measure the success. And um, it, I don't know. I'd like to kind of, you know, after ten years of doing this, are we are we achieving our goals from a policy perspective? In addition to um, you know, I mean, for instance, you know, I, not all grants have to be funded every year. We don't have to spend the entire money, and perhaps we need to look at ways. I've been arguing for quite a while about working with, and I've talked to, I think Jenny and I've talked a bit about working with other state agencies and figuring out other ways to support the local governments that fits the Montana model. Um, so just some broad comments, but I, I think more transparency, publishing the quarterly reports, publishing the data that's submitted so that they can be evaluated and objectively um, and and really weaving in. I'd, I'd like to see more specific objectives on training personally. So several grants this year where they were teaching people or, you know, proposing to teach people ArcGIS Pro in two sessions, which is not possible. Um, so that's some general observations. Normally, I, I recuse myself from this process, but I don't have any grants this year, so I'll take an opportunity to just provide some constructive criticism. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. Um, I have just a simple clarification question. Page one, it looks like the grant to Bitterroot is uh, 14 even. On uh, page two in the table, it's 14.4, which is correct. The table is correct. I apologize for the error. No, no worries. So uh, maybe when it comes time and we have a motion to accept this 
recommendation, we could uh, take it as given that we're um, accepting the, the recommendations built into the table, not into the memo. So this is Elsie. I have a question for Aaron. Um, regarding the 12 that are getting funded, number three, which is the Department of Commerce, which is not a local government uh, entity, could we could you just explain why the Department of Commerce for the Census is getting uh, 9.6? So the grant process, just so, just so everyone knows, just a reminder, the grant process is open to um, to uh, state government, local governments, and tribal governments and universities. So. Um, the govern the actual in, in honestly we don't really get a lot of um, state departments filling out grants anymore. We were working with the Department of Commerce on one this year, but that one uh, didn't didn't come to fruition. But this project is tied to um, this one actually scored the highest, and it's tied. Um, but what, the other two were prioritized above it because of uh, past grants. Anyway, this one is tied to census. Um, the census 2020 it's in preparation for the census and so it's based on um, uh, pr preparation for the, uh, the, the census bureau's um, decennial census and they are going to be working on voting districts and those voting districts help define the statistical boundaries where they divide up the population so it's a very timely um, grant in that um, this is the only time it can be done uh, until next decennial census census, which would be, you know, an, in another 10 years. Did that answer Thank your you. question? Do you need more? It did. It did. Thank you. Okay. Elsie, th th this is Ken. Uh, just a follow-up comment. Um, Elsie, I, there have been grants in the past that um, have not been directly through OPI, but that have been um, pr submitted by Montana schools, which have been very successful. Sure. And, um, you know, for example, um, we had a grant that was that had to be canceled in the, in the town of Lewistown um, for, for the person that wrote it was gone missing essentially, but, but we had a very successful presentation at our GIS conference, Geocon this year by a group, a GIS club that did a, an amazing application for, um, uh, for uh, that the students put together in the seventh and eighth grades there. So some exemplary projects have come forth from schools. I really encourage that in the future. Good idea. Any other questions or comments? So coming, one more, this is Elsie. On the ones that, uh, 13 and 14 between Harlem and uh, the Hamilton area, so it's my understanding and I appreciate the explanation that you gave on the other page. So is there been any discussion with the city of Harlem to accept it or to decline it? No, not yet. I was waiting on the um, what I spoke with Jenny. She had um, had had told me to wait till the commission um, uh, had met and decided on it before we went ahead to try to work with them. And so to uh, to, to basically um, get your approval or disapproval for the current prioritization and then work with them. So no, I did not take that step yet. So it's my understanding that if, if that's the case, there's no way to split the funds equally and give them either be, uh, it looks like you're giving the whole amount to, uh, not the whole amount to Harlem because there isn't that remaining. But your, your factor of breaking them up then is uh, you have a, an algorithm or how are you planning on doing that? So basically, the um, we would offer the 17, the remaining balance, the 17,037 to Harlem because they scored higher, and so they're ranked higher. We would offer it to them first, and um, and if they were able to accomplish anything from their grant with that amount, we would just go ahead and move forward and give them that full amount of 17,037. Um, if they did not accept that, we would fully fund the uh, number 14 which would be the Bitterroot Conservation District. And so that remaining balance would just go back into the coffer. 
Thank you. So, Aaron, if I understand correctly, we'll, you would need to determine uh, whether or not the City of Harlem was able to work with approximately 40, 43% of, of the requested grant award. And if not, it would go to a bidder. Exactly. And we would, we would encourage them to reapply next year. Any other questions or comments about this, uh, um, uh, about these awards? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to accept um, the awards as stated in the uh, uh, two-page memo with that one correction changing uh, Bitterroot from 14 in the memo to 14.4 as per the table? This is very nice, so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Kenning, I'll second. And I'm sorry, who's that? Is that Kenning? Kenning, yes. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Yes, I'd like to abstain, Ken. Okay, Ken, thank you. So it passes uh, uh, with all ayes but one abstention. Let's move on to our second item in the agenda then, please, the one-time only grants to public libraries. And who wants to uh, uh, walk us through this? Um, this is Jenny. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. So as the memo outlines, last June when the commission adopted a library development budget, uh, it was at that point that we knew that coming out of the 2017 legislative session that we had a, a, a larger appropriation of coal severance tax monies than we had spent in the previous biennium and that we had our own account to manage those funds and we were estimating based on the amount of authority granted to us through the legislature to spend coal severance tax monies that we would have about $124,000 that was not budgeted for other priorities that we have funded through the coal severance tax monies. And you'll recall at the time that we also knew that public libraries were not going to receive their state aid funding uh, due to legislative action. And so in order to try to make up for some of that loss, the commission had uh, adopted a budget that appropriated that 124000 in in coal severance tax monies as a one-time only grant to public libraries uh, allocated according to the Federation plans of service. And of course, as we now know, cash flow in that account has proven challenging. We didn't have the cash flow in the early part of fiscal year to pay our bills for OCLC as well as the Circe Dynex bill for the Montana Shared Catalog. And we didn't have the funding to pay Federation grants in the fall as is typical. Instead, we had to pay them in February. Now, that money is starting to come in, but it's not coming in at a rate that would allow us to uh, pay that one-time only grant in a timely manner so that the libraries could actually make use of those monies before June 30th. And if we don't leave any kind of balance in our new coal severance tax account, uh, it's likely we're going to run into the same kind of cash flow challenges that we experienced this year. So it's our recommendation that rather than expending any kind of balance in that account as one-time only monies to the public libraries, that we instead rescind that action and leave any kind of balance in that account to be expended next fiscal year in order to help address the cash flow challenges that uh, we experienced this year and, and hopefully get us on a, a better footing for managing that cash flow in the future. So the action that we're requesting today would be to rescind that authority that the commission granted us last June in granting those one-time only monies and instead just authorize us to leave that any kind of balance left in that account uh, for use next fiscal year.
any discussion regarding this um, or any, thank you for that explanation. Uh, any further discussion about this or questions for Jenny or Chris? I, I, there's one question, you know, have the, the affected libraries, um, has this been discussed with them? Yes, yes it has. Uh, we knew that very few of the libraries were actually budgeting to receive this money. A couple were, and they've been notified that um, it's likely they wouldn't receive these monies. Uh, um, if the commission does not take this action, they would obviously receive a smaller amount than the 124000 because we don't have that money in the account at this point in time. Uh, but we have made all public libraries aware that given the cash flow challenges, it's unlikely that they would receive uh, any money this year. How, how seriously did that inconvenience those libraries that had budgeted for this? Do you want me to answer that, Jenny? This is Tracy. Please, yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, the libraries were disappointed, but what they said to me was, we went ahead and budgeted it, so it would be in there, we'll just simply adjust. And they had a couple of them that I had talked to, since it was one time only, they were just going to have, make purchases that were one time only kinds of purchases, and they just won't make those purchases. Will um, uh, basically foregoing this disbursement place us in good enough shape, do we believe, next year in terms of cash flow with the CST? You know, it'll, it'll certainly help. Uh, it, I think realistically we would like to maybe get to a point where we would see one quarter's cash balance in an account. Uh, we have some fairly large bills that total about uh, 276,000 within the first quarter of the fiscal year. Um, we, we didn't have that amount come in until uh, a little more than halfway through the fiscal year this year. Um, so I don't think it'll get us all the way there, but it's a, it's a good step in the right direction. Does, does, do you or Chris, do you folks need the commission to take any action that would take and uh, help with that cash flow? beyond this recent rescinding this? I mean, there's really nothing, no action that you guys can take. It's all the collections that are coming in on that coal severance tax. Um, we all know just because we have our own count that it's this issue has been there for years. Um, it's just now that we have our own cap account and have to manage our own cash flow. Um, but definitely by setting this amount aside, what we're doing is we're underspending our appropriation that the legislature gave us. So remember, I can only spend the amount that is appropriated through the legislature. So basically we're going to say we're not going to spend that $100,000. we will revert that appropriation, but that cash that came in can stay in the bank, can stay in there. And, and just like Jenny said, come July 1st, and as the money flows in, we'll have that 100000 to at least get some bills going the very first start of fiscal 19. And hopefully that cash flow keeps picking up and, and carries us. So like Jenny said, I think it's, a, it's about the only option that we have out there right now. Thank you. I think in the future, and we've talked a little bit about this, uh, you know, we can look at our library development budget and work with the Network Advisory Council to uh, try to identify any options in that budget for items that might be able to weather different volatility in cash flow um, and try to align uh, certain budget items with, with items that have a little bit more fiscal certainty, if that exists in, in this day and age. Uh, but that's certainly something that we'll be thinking about in the future as well. Do any of the vendors to whom we have these these large obligations, would they allow us to pay on a monthly basis or something like that to help us sort of get our feet underneath us in terms of cash flow? I just, I just, I mean, obviously at some point we'll have accumulated a quarter's worth of money in the bank. And, and at that point, this, this cash flow problem will 
be something we have to manage, but it won't be as acute as it seems to have been with the startup of, of paying this way. I'm just wondering if there's anything we can do to basically get beyond this sort of startup awkwardness, get beyond these awkward teenage years and move into a, a more predictable sort of cash flow. You know, I think that's a question that CARE would have to negotiate with the vendors. Um, and again, I think we would still try to get the Federation money out there right away because that's, you know, they in turn have obligations that they have to pay. Um, you know, in looking at this, this will probably be the only time I recommend that you don't spend your whole appropriation. What you have to hope happens is your cash flow comes in higher than your appropriation. So you can start building that yeah. more. You, you know, I think it's very defensible why we didn't spend it this time. And it was definitely an OTO. But in the future, I would tell you guys, I would recommend that you spend your whole appropriation um, because you don't want the legislature looking like you're always leaving money on the table. So. Right. Is there any danger of an audit thing for this? Um, potentially, um, I, but I think there's a good argument, and that's why and Jenny and I talked that I wanted that I recommended, and Jenny agreed that we should really have commission action on this because you had taken commission action right. for that money to go out. So I think it's very defendable and defensible, and I think it's a good cash management that we're watching our cash. So, but again, I wouldn't keep recommending this. But I think this one time it, it helps the bank. So. so what you need is a uh, from the commission is a uh, um, a motion to rescind our former allocation. What's the language you need? Jenny, do you have it in that memo? Yeah, unobligate. Unobligate. Or just um, yeah, unobligate the one time only additional federation payment. Basically, is what you're doing. Do I hear a motion to that effect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is Ken Wall. I'll move. So, Ken, you, you've moved the, to uh, adopt that language, a motion with that language? Yes. Thank you. You, you were breaking up just a bit. Do I hear a second? I second. This is Ann. Thank you very much, Ann. Any further discussion? All those in favor to unobligate the previously budgeted funds for one-time only grants to public libraries, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. And thank you, staff, for walking us through these slightly serpentine corridors here. Uh, last but not least, it looks like, uh, we have an item, uh, Library Services Technology Act Remaining Funds Action, and uh, is that for you to walk us through? Uh, yes, this is Tracy, and I presented this at your April meeting, just kind of to let you know that, of course, we had quite a bit of vacancy savings uh, due to Mike Price, the information specialist position, remaining open most of the fiscal year, as well as the lifelong learning librarian. And after your meeting, you had kind of asked me to check in with the libraries and see what they think. So at MLA, I took that opportunity, met with the Public Library Director's Interest Group. It's probably about a third of the public libraries were represented in that room. And they talked through these different options. And at first, um, they definitely wanted to um, say that any LSTA funds were applied to the entire OCLC contract rather than just public libraries only, which was an idea I had presented to the commission. The public libraries really felt like it should be one for all, all for one, which I thought was lovely. After they talked through it, though, they said, you know, budget-wise, it is challenging to um, explain those huge decreases and then increases because their budget would go down 30% next year, but then the following year it would increase by 35% um, because it would go back to what it was plus the inflationary rate that we need to pay OCLC. And so after talking through it, the public library directors really liked what you are seeing on this memo is option one, which is um, not option one, I'm sorry, let's scroll down, option three, which is to apply the unallocated funds in more traditional ways. This is following what we've done in the past at the state library. 
I then took this um, to the school library division. It was a much smaller crowd. Um, they didn't really have any strong feelings one way or the other. If they had any kind of opinion, it was they liked the OCLC contract idea and applying the funds there. And then I reached out to OnWired to t ask librarians for feedback from around the state. Most didn't have um, very strong opinions. I would say they liked, they were fine with whatever option we chose and didn't lean one way or the other. So I took all of this information to the Network Advisory Council this morning, and that group, um, just as a reminder, libraries from different types of libraries are on the Network Advisory Council, all different sizes of libraries are on the NAC, and so they kind of really represent the Montana library community pretty well. And they had a really good discussion and really went back and forth between these different options. Um, and they kind of finally came to the consensus that they felt that the best option to choose was three. And so I'm going to show you the spreadsheet that they saw this morning. And this was their final recommendation that they voted on and asked me to bring to you as to how we will spend the LSTA 17 funds. And so I'll just kind of give you a few moments to, to look at this. But in essence, um, we would pay for the first three months of the state library's portion of the OCLC bill, Overdrive, and Circe Dynex, which would be the vendor that supports the Montana Shared Catalog. We would need to replace our two tablet labs and a few of our projectors. And then we could pay for our first three months of GoToMeeting. Um, for software purchases, and then the data analytics software. This is a one-time only cost that we could pursue that would assist us with kind of analysis of textual based data. And then the remainder would be applied to, we have one position that isn't on the kind of the federal fiscal year of October 1 to September 30th, and this would get them much closer to that uh, federal fiscal year. So they they tend to roll over into our new award much earlier than any other position. And so this would have them rolling over closer to October 1. And these FY17 funds need to be spent by? September 30th, 2018. Do you have any questions for me? I was part of uh, the NACS meeting this morning, and um, while I didn't vote, um, uh, I can report, as Tracy said, that it was a, it was a good discussion, and um, all the options were kind of discussed, and there were some people in favor of one and in favor of the other, and others in favor of others. They finally came to sort of a consensus that this was the preferable way to go, and that was their recommendation to us, the commission. Any questions or comments about this? Then do I hear a, a, a motion to um, adopt this, this budget or, or a spending plan for the remaining uh, LSTA FY17 funds as shown on, on the, your screens now? No move. This is Kenning. Thank you, Kenning. A second? This is Aaron, I'll second. Thank you very much, Aaron. Any further discussion? All in favor then, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed by nay. Any abstentions? And the motion passes. Any any other business or public comment? Or do we have any of of, of the public uh, online here with us? Any of you staff? Commission, anything that we need to talk about before we adjourn? Uh, this is Jenny, and I just first want to thank staff for accommodating this meeting with several of us all over the country and world. So 
so thank you, staff. And I, I also want to acknowledge the great work of our advisory councils, both ENLIAC and the NAC, for bringing the commission these very thoughtful recommendations. You know, we're really so well represented by these, these two advisory committees. So um, I think we should acknowledge them as well. And then finally, Bruce, I just wanted to let you know, Connie was texting me and saying that she was having internet troubles. And I think that's why she wasn't able to join the meeting. Okay, then maybe we can have the uh, minutes show that she is excused for so broadband. We need more broadband. That's right. <laughs> and we had some great conversations with uh, our congressional delegation about broadband needs and opportunities here in the state. Broadband to Brockway. Well, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any, any other comments? Meetings adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you all for taking time again for joining us. Good luck in DC, guys. Thanks, Elsie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Drive safely. Enjoy the grandbaby. Not Aaron.